Are you interested in a resource that offers clear, concise point-of-care drug information? Look no further. Lexicon provides nurse practitioners answers to medication-related questions with exclusive drug references, databases, and interactive tools. With several online and mobile packages available, Lexicom's extensive pharmacology content is accessible and easy to use. Learn how Lexicom can help support safe medication decision making by visiting lexicomp.me slash ncnp. That's lexicomp.me slash ncnp and use promo code ncnp25 to save 25% on a first time annual or longer subscription on all Lexicom packages and handbooks. In this episode of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast, Jamil Nagtalon Ramos discusses Filipino American nurses. Can you tell me about your research on Filipino American nurses and why you were interested in this topic? Well, thank you for this question. I'm a third generation Filipino nurse. My grandmother was a nurse in the Philippines, and my mother is a pediatric ICU nurse still working in northern New Jersey. So between the three of us, we have over 100 years of nursing service, and I'm very, very proud of that. So you may kind of say, I guess, that nursing runs in my blood. I have been in the nursing profession myself for 20 years, and everywhere I go, everywhere I go, every time someone finds out that I'm a nurse, nurse practitioner, and that I was born and raised in the Philippines, the first thing they tell me is their experience working with or being cared for or their family member was being cared for by a Filipino nurse. But not only that, but they tell me how wonderful of an experience it was or it is. So they'll say, you know, I worked with a Filipino nurse in, you know, um, anywhere from like California to New York City to rural Idaho. <laughs> I would hear from a lot of people saying that they've worked with a Filipino nurse or Filipino American nurse or their family had been very well cared for by a Filipino nurse and how what a positive experience that was for them. That kind of makes sense to me because most immigrant healthcare workers in the US are from the Philippines. There's about 150,000 of us. But I was always curious about how we were or how we were not represented actually in leadership. So again, I've been working in this industry for 20 years and I probably can count in my you know, in my hand, how many Filipino or Filipino American nurses I know who are in a leadership capacity. This means a provost or a dean, assistant dean in the academic side or in the um, healthcare side, a CNO or CEO being an, an assistant director or department director. I have not met many of those. And I thought to myself, is this just an N of one? Is it just this an experience, pers a personal experience of mine, or is this happening across the country? Are we not represented in leadership across our profession? So when I started asking people, other friends, you know, so when when someone says to me, "Yeah, I, you know, I worked with a Filipino nurse," I, the next question I started asking was, "Okay, so." have you met a Filipino nurse in a leadership position? So they'll say, oh, mm, maybe, maybe, I think I know this one person. So it's interesting that, you know, um, we are very much well represented in, in nursing in terms of um, bedside nursing as a staff nurse, but we are not represented in leadership. So I wanted to figure out why, and I wanted to figure out if this was just, again, a personal experience or was this across the nation? So I went back to school for my doctorate at, um, at Penn Graduate School of Education and wanted to look into this topic. So my dissertation topic was on the educational attainment of Filipino American nurses. I wanted to really go into the facilitators and the barriers to educational attainment. So we know that Filipino and Filipino American nurses represent an impressive share of the nursing workforce, as I said. But again, we're not well represented in advanced practice, faculty, and executive leadership position, both in academia and in the healthcare systems. Obtaining a graduate degree in nursing has the potential to open a wider range of opportunities to meet the healthcare demands of a population that is growing older and increasingly becoming more diverse. 
The purpose of my study of my dissertation was to examine the factors affecting graduate degree pursuit for BSN prepared Filipino and Filipino American nurses working in the United States. So I really, again, wanted to look at what facilitates this obtaining of a graduate degree and what are the barriers. So my study revealed that the determination to provide a better life for their family and a commitment to advancing the profession were incentives to pursuing a graduate degree. In addition, having a reliable network of colleagues and peer mentors was essential to persisting in their program. Across all generations, finances were a major barrier to educational attainment. I saw that many of my participants in my study said that they really struggled financially in terms of allocating money towards a graduate degree. So we have this cultural phenomenon in the Philippines, um, in Filipino culture, I should say, called utang na loob, which means debt reciprocity. This means that my participants said their parents sent them to school, right, to, to go to nursing school to have a better life. And they feel very much indebted, not only to their parents, but also to the community that supported them to be able to succeed in nursing school. And because they have a nursing degree, they were able to apply for a job in the United States and immigrate here, you know, again, for this better life. And so they feel very much that they should return that debt and they do it so willingly, right? They do it so willingly um, and it's not a burden, but it's actually a big share of their paycheck goes back to support their parents, their relatives, um, and their community back home in the Philippines. So I interviewed first generation, second generation, 1.5 generation actually also, and third generation Filipino American nurses. And again, across all generations, finances were, um, were a major barrier to educational attainment. Again, primarily because of this utang na loob, because of this debt reciprocity, and really wanting to give back to their families back home. But I really wanted to look into what were the motivators and again the barriers because having that graduate degree allows for a nurse to advance their career so with a graduate degree they can become a nurse practitioner they can go into an executive role or a leadership role and being in a leadership role that allows for us to have a seat at the table and to me that's really important for us to be represented in leadership because that's the way that we can move policy and that's the way that we can really make a difference in a macro perspective. We have seen in the news the disproportionate number of Filipino American nurses dying from COVID-19. What do you think are the contributing factors to this? Yes. Um, according to a study published by the National Nurses United, the largest nurses union in the United States, 67 Filipino nurses have died of COVID. This number is a third of the total number of registered nurses who have died in the U.S. because of COVID. Even though Filipino nurses only make up 4% of the total number of nurses in the United States overall. So, you know, a big proportion, a third of that total number of registered nurses who have died in the U.S. of COVID were Filipinos. I really think that this is actually rooted in the geopolitical history of the Philippines and the U.S. I'm going to take you all the way back to early 1900s when the U.S. quote unquote annexed the Philippines and established formal education in the Philippines. And so when they did that, they actually also established nursing schools in the Philippines. When I actually was in the Philippines uh, growing up, I actually went to a school that was established by Americans. And when I came to America, people would say, wow, your English is so good. Needless to say, you know, I, they didn't know that I actually had um, English classes all the way from, you know, nursery school. And so this is not an experience that's special to me or to my school, but actually most Filipinos speak English very well because they actually have um, had English classes because our 
educational system was um, designed or was established for, um, by Americans who were in the uh, in the Philippines. So with that said, our nursing schools were established by Americans as well. So we were trained, or I would say um, the Filipino nurses were trained in the American nursing, right? So fast forward to the 1960s when they had changed immigration laws and the 70s and the 80s where there were shortages of nurses in the United States. We in the Philippines, the United States saw that there were Filipino nurses that could be recruited to fill the gap for the shortage in the United States. And so think about it as, you know, in the 80s, there were staffing shortages exacerbated by the HIV AIDS epidemic. And basically Filipino nurses were recruited to work in areas where white American nurses did not want to work at or work in. So these were the intensive care units. And so for example, I'm going to give the example of my mom, who was recruited back in 1986 to come to the United States to work and fill the gap of that nursing shortage. And so she works, she still works in the same unit. And decades later, it's in a pediatric intensive care unit. And so, you know, she filled that gap in a high risk unit. So when all these Filipino nurses were recruited, they were recruited to work in these high risk acute units. And so when the pandemic hit, these Filipino nurses were in the front lines. They were in these intensive care units caring for the most acute, most vulnerable of our patients. And so they were exposed and they were exposed to COVID in a large number. And so in my study, not related to, you know, this was done before COVID, but when I was talking to my participants, right, they talked a lot about this Filipino cultural phenomenon called pakikipag kapwa. Kapwa means your neighbor, your sister, your brother. It's a human life. So they were treating their patients, right? They treat their patients as their kapwa, as their um, brother or sister. So Many of my participants will say, I take care of my patients as if they are my own family. I'm committed to them. I don't give up on them. I treat them like they're my own brother or sister or they're my mom and dad. And so I can just see Filipino nurses working in these intensive care units and they are taking care again of patients who have COVID. And not wanting to, you know, abandon them or give up on them or quit because of this idea of kapwa. They treat them as their own family members. They're not going to give up on them, even if it's, you know, for the sake of their own safety and well-being. So I think, you know, that's a very long answer to that question, but um, I really think that there's many factors to it. And it was not an accident that many Filipino nurses work in intensive care units. This has been centuries of work that has um, not an accident for us to be in intensive care units and working in intensive care units. How is the Filipino American nursing community dealing with the crisis? So as I mentioned before, this cultural phenomenon, pakikipag kapwa, that also applies to nurses taking care of each other, taking care of our kapwa, kapwa nurses, like our, um, our sisters and brothers in nursing. And so I think the Filipino community has really come together, especially the Filipino American nursing community has come together to find ways to take care of each other and to um, show resilience. So part of that really is actually putting in priority our mental health. So I know personally in our culture, we don't prioritize mental health or we don't think of it as in the same level of physical health. When it comes to treating um, you know, uh, 
like having sadness or having anger due to the situation of the pandemic, right? So we go to work, we do our work, we care for our patients, care for our kapwa and treat them like our family members. Sometimes even if we think that our well-being is suffering. So either we're mentally exhausted and sad and angry about the situation of the pandemic, especially in the first few months of the pandemic, there was a lot of, you know, uh, questions or there were, we were trying to just also all figure it out um, as we were going, right? Um, There were a lot of um, still unanswered questions, especially in the first few months. And so I think that we've, you know, we've finally, we've come to realize that that type of, you know, just go to work, work, come home and do it again the next day. That is not sustainable. That was not sustainable, especially in this situation. So um, I'm part of the Philippine Nurses Association of America, and they have done many uh, webinars in talking about caring for yourself and your well-being, mental health, putting that into priority. And through the PNAA, they also have regional meetings. And in these uh, regional meetings, again, they're taking into priority, caring for each other, you know, checking in on each other, putting well-being and mental health as a priority and re- recognizing that, you know, we just went through a year and a half of really, really hard stuff, you know, that the pandemic had taken a toll on the Filipino nursing community as a whole and also on us individually, you know, and recognizing and saying, yes, it's okay. It's okay to be tired. We are tired. Checking in on us, making sure that our friends and family are doing well, talking out and talking about, you know, the best practices on how we can be safe and also talking about how we can support each other inside and outside of work. So I think there's, you know, a a bigger conversation, though, of in terms of policies and bigger conversation about um, the nursing, the Filipino nursing community and be again, tied to my study of being part of that leadership in our hospitals, being part of that leadership in the academic setting, being part of leadership in health systems so that that we have a seat at the table and we can really put into priority the safety and well-being of not just our Filipino American nursing community, but the nursing community in general. How have you dealt with COVID-19 personally in your workplace? I think in the beginning of this pandemic, there were a lot of unknowns. And I have three children, three young children at home. And my first concern was bringing it home. I think that was a major concern for my nursing colleagues, all my healthcare colleagues. There were a lot of things that we didn't know. And so a lot of our concern, not just for our own well-being, but our concern also was, oh my goodness, am I going to be bringing the virus home? And I know for myself, I said to myself, um, you know, I'm going to take every precaution possible because, you know, I would not ever, ever be able to forgive myself if I brought it home and made my family sick. So that was just so mentally draining and stressful in the beginning of the pandemic. And now that we're seeing the light, I would say that more adults and younger adults are being vaccinated and we're actually seeing, you know, um, the light. I still want to make sure that we acknowledge and remember, and it's okay to acknowledge how mentally stressful it was a year and a half ago and how emotionally draining it was the first few months of the pandemic. You know, I teach at Rutgers University and um, I see patients one day a week at Penn Medicine. And, you know, I was seeing a lot of stress from my students at the school having to switch over to virtual and online learning and you know, not having that hands-on for my nursing students was really tough on them. 
And also, again, um, thinking about now they have to be home and living at home and in uh, the stress of not having protected time for them to study, protected time for them to do their schoolwork. And then, you know, the flip side of the stress of my patients, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know. We, you know, we were looking at different ways for keeping our patients safe. And that, you know, that meant we restricted visitors. That meant some moms, patients that had babies, you know, had their um, partner with them, but then didn't have any other family member be able to come and be with them during labor and birth. And, you know, I took all of that, I think, mentally and emotionally processed it and kind of carried it because I just felt so badly for my patients and my students and what they were going through. So yeah, the first, I, I would say the first few months of the pandemic really was um, emotionally, emotionally took a toll on me. You know, I tried to take care of myself in different ways, practicing yoga, walking. My girls and I made a goal of walking two miles a day, you know, two or three times a week, you know, having just some time to myself to not really be doing anything, maybe listening to music, maybe reading, slowing everything down for myself, because everything else was so fast paced at, you know, at both my clinical job and also at the school. So that was really tough in both workplaces. And especially in the beginning when there was a lack of PPE, there was a shortage of PPE everywhere. And so that was tough for all of us not having enough N95s or maybe not enough goggles or masks. All of that kind of definitely took a toll on many nurses. I know colleagues from different hospitals across the country who took some time off from nursing and or really just needed to kind of recalibrate their priorities. And some people were able to do that and had the capacity to do that and some people couldn't. And again, I think being a Filipino American nurse, I have that in me that whole pakikipagkapwa, right? And to me, I it was important for me to take care of my kapwa like they are my family. So it was important for me to make sure that I'm taking good care of my patients holistically and really putting myself in their situation that they are experiencing such an important aspect of their life, which is, you know, having having a baby <laughs> and where it was used to be such a celebrated and it is still is a celebrated event. I think a lot of my patients were really afraid of being in the hospital. And instead of celebrating this event, they were riddled with anxiety and they were, you know, wanting to go home as soon as possible, really afraid of getting COVID while they were in the hospital, exposing themselves, exposing their partners, exposing their baby while they were in the hospital. So I think a lot of that. Again, I I carried all of that mentally and emotionally and physically. And so I knew for myself that I had to make sure that I was putting my well-being also in priority. You know, in the workplace, I really tried to be as positive as possible in both workplaces and be there for my students, you know, to even taking the time with them to ask them how they're taking care of themselves. You know, everything was virtual. I'm not in person. I'm not in front of them. It was harder to let them know how much I cared about them. And so, you know, taking the time even five minutes before class or in the beginning of class and asking them what positive thing they were looking forward to that day or how they were going to take care of themselves for that week. I think those are things that I really tried to instill in them that someone cares and, you know, that we care about their well-being and not just being successful in school, but that we were going through a pandemic and to acknowledge that and they will come out of it even more resilient and even better nurse because of what they were going through. So I think now that we are, again, a year and a half 
since this pandemic started. We have better answers for questions about the um, about COVID. We now have the vaccine, which I have been promoting and to all my friends, um, my patients, my family members. There's a lot of myths out there about the vaccine that I'm happy to answer questions from. I'm getting all these texts from friends and family and colleagues asking about the vaccine itself. So I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful for what's to come. I'm excited for us to, again, hopefully turning the corner. We're not there quite yet. We're still being very cautious. We're still limiting our interactions with others. And uh, my youngest one is still not vaccinated. So I'm still very cautious about her. I feel like I have so much hope of what's going to come next because I know that this past year and a half was so hard on everyone and more uh, more so on others. I'm lucky that, you know, my family stayed safe. And for the most part, I know that a lot of people really struggled with employment, you know, with with quarantining and with having COVID. So I, I know that I have many blessings to be thankful for. But, you know, lots of work still ahead to be done, for sure. This podcast does not constitute medical advice and should not be taken as such, and does not replace professional judgment or advice. The ideas and viewpoints expressed in this podcast do not reflect the official position of the speakers, authors, affiliated organizations, the Nurse Practitioner Journal, or Walters Kluwer.